curriculum planning, starting the process around applying for research grants, um, onboarding um, new staff members to the university, university and processing our, uh, our casual staff um, onboarding as well. ServiceNow offers our developers the opportunity to build applications that are specific to the unique requirements of the university and deploy them inside a workflow and knowledge management environment uh, that can couple those um, unique applications uh, seamlessly into our mainstream service management delivery framework. Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to ServiceNow Knowledge, everybody. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship product. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Chris Pope is here from the Office of the Strategy area of ServiceNow, the, uh, the Office of the Chief Strategy Officer, excuse me. Chris, welcome back to theCUBE. <laughs> well done for getting that one out. <laughs> yeah, right, Good to be yeah, back, yeah. guys. Good to see you. Good to see you I too. see the Chief Strategy Officer walking around all over the place. Everywhere Amazing. I go, I right. see Dave. But uh, so anyway, congratulations on another successful knowledge, you guys. Yep. Strategy's working. <laughs> Seems to be, right? Uh, no, it's fantastic. I mean, 11,000 customers. Um, you know, this is my 10th. Five as a customer, five as an employee, um, which is, you know, quite special. And the growth is incredible, you know? And I think I was just talking to somebody downstairs, another press analyst, and they were saying, we've never, we haven't heard a single negative comment all week. Everyone just seems to be happy. Is it in the air? You're pumping something through the, you know, the air conditioning. But they are, they're just generally happy. And, you know, as you saw this morning, the innovation is insane, right? I mean, what Fred does, he loves to do, and clearly he loves it so much he broke it, right? <laughs> As he said <laughs> earlier, right? But that's the, the fact that the founder has still got his hands in and doing things like that is just incredible. And I think customers, it resonates with them and he shows them how, how easy it can be and away you go, right? And you've managed to maintain kind of the smaller conference <coughs> field. You know, we, we go to a lot of shows and yep. you, there's definitely a vibe at a really small conference yeah. the first couple of years when everyone is so collaborative and sharing ideas and, and, and it's not kind of a vendor show, which a lot of yeah. things go to. You still, still have feel, this feel. Yeah, feels it still like feels this. intimate, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, and you know, as you know, I travel a lot, I meet lots of customers and it blows my mind how many people you suddenly recognize and you think 11,000 people, you're going to get lost in the sea of it, but no. You actually recognize the faces and the people and things going on and, and you have a connection because you've visited them, you've talked to them, you've helped them with something. Um, and it still feels like that, even though there's 11,000 people running around, you know, which is just fantastic. It's, it, it's, it, it keeps the core, it still feels a bit startup-like in that kind of, you know, the crazy, the fanboys and you hit all the clapping for Fred and the, what the guys did on stage this morning because that's what people love but it still feels small and intimate and like it's for you. And the clapping's genuine, you know, we, you know, we do a lot of these events and a lot of times it's like, you know, the Jeb Bush, please clap for me, you know? <laughs> you get a little golf clap, but it's, you know, the audience is passionate. I mean, the place was packed yep. this morning, big party last night, you figure, okay, the place is going to be empty. It, it wasn't, people want to yeah. go, they want to see Fred, they want to see what Pat's talking about. But the strategy, as I said, seems to be working and it's like these concentric circles, you start with the core, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. I was in the financial analysts meeting on Monday. Uh -huh. The TAM keeps getting bigger and right. bigger. I'm just going to say you're, you're sandbagging the TAM now because I know it's going to be you know, bigger next year. But, <laughs> but to talk about that TAM expansion, you guys have done a marvelous job of going beyond that sort of stodgy old IT, <clears throat> service management, help desk <laughs> stuff yep. into a really exciting transformational business. I think. It's actually two problems. So I think there's still a core constituency in the ITM space, that, the ITSM space that has to be served, mm -hmm. taken care of, because these guys keep the lights on, right? They keep it running. But then you go beyond that. And I think what we found a lot is point solutions are left behind. We displace the traditionals, right? And the, the, you know, a lot of the Soviet area software we've talked about previously. Um, <laughs> but there's still point solutions out there. And over time, as our platform grows and the TAM grows, right, into customer service, the ITOM suite, you know, you just spoke with Mike and that. Those point solutions are now the targets because they want a single platform, they want a single way for it all to work together seamlessly. And then there's just natural things that, you know, customers are like, God, oh, this would be really good if we could do this in our call centers, our true customer service situations. And we rely on IT massively because the phones are ringing, you know, online banking's down or, or goodness knows what's down. We don't have the insight into the IT world of what they're doing and there's this big disconnect. We've joined those dots now perfectly, and it's a natural, easy transition to do it. And you saw Fiserv on stage, you know, as part of the opening keynote. 
They just smashed that thing in a matter of weeks, and they've connected their true business where audit, reputation, and you know, financials, you know, these are the guys paying their bills, are connected now to IT. And they know this seamlessly through one simple, you know, one platform, and it just works together. Well, so imagine 10 years ago, you're starting a company and you went in, you were testing your ideas with all the analysts and all the experts, and you came in and said, you know what, forget about selling to the line of business. What we're going to do is we're going to go to IT, we're going to fix IT, we're going to enable IT to help us sell to the line of business. People said, you're out of your mind. Yeah. That'll and never it, happen. It's, and me, <laughs> right? Okay, you're the next one. Why are you better or any different than anybody else, right? And I think truly, you know, having been the customer, that upgrade, that painful implementation cycle, that's the first nut Fred cracked, and it just worked, right? And mm. we see this all the time in, when you're out in the field with customers and you say, okay, well, we're good, let's, let's spin up a proof of concept or do something. And literally, while we're in the room, the environment's ready. And they're like, what? No consultants to fly in. We don't need to you know, load databases, pull fiber for storage and all. It's done. Move on, guys. That's the old way of doing things. It's just there now. And the really, we've solved the how problem. It's what problem do you want to solve with it? And too often in technology, we focus on how we want to solve a problem without actually knowing what the problem is in the first place. And we go like this and you know, shadow IT and all these other things that people talk about. That's why they occur, because IT can't move fast enough. But they're also not delivering to the right problem that the business actually have in the first place. Talk about some of the different ways in which customers are reskilling as a result yeah. of service there's now. A, there's a big shift. You, know, you, you have less of the geeks with their hands on the tin, if you will, in the data center. And we've heard a lot about Amazon and Azure and all these other things, right? So you, you used to be absolutely accountable and responsible for the service. Now, though, you're still accountable, but the responsibility of the day-to-day -day running shifted. It might be in another you know, cloud, might be somewhere else or whatever it is, but you still are accountable for that service to your business. So the guys in IT and the girls in IT now, they're kind of service brokers, and where you used to have you know, monthly service reviews that were done by procurement or the vendor management team who you know, would beat the vendor up over some kind of SLA, penalties, whatever it is, without actually knowing what the service is doing and if anyone's even happy with it. Some of those skills are now coming back into technology because y you have to do that now. And if you look at the, the account contacts we have with our customers around planning upgrades and patches and different things like that, they're that service broker now and having the relationship with us and the transparency we give them into the availability and all the other controls we give them through self-service. You never used to have that. So those roles in IT are changing to be, I'm not going to say vendor management type people because they're still technical, but they're having to have, you know, they actually have to learn how to talk to people now, which is quite interesting. You know, not just sit in front of a screen and tip right. tap away all day. <laughs> you know, it's these relationship skills and our very, very large, very successful customers, it feels like a relationship and we do technology as well, which is, is, is massive, you know? And you just feel a huge uh, kind of pressure valve release from those from those folks that have right. plenty to do, as we've talked to a number right. of people, what do you do with all the new time that you freed up as yep. you've automated these process? And <laughs> they said, we got lots to do, yep. and the budgets aren't going up. Yep. So really enabling them to start to apply their expertise to different things. Yep. No, it's true, you know, one of our largest financial services customers will go live on the 27th of May. Eight months, 40,000 users, right? And that's, it's an execution plan at this point. We're, we're going, it's going to happen. The conversations I've had in the last couple of months with them and even this week is, you know, we don't want another eight month project. We want to go four weeks, four weeks, four weeks, and we want to release and we want to move. And we're already talking about the next 20, 30 things they want to do that traditionally would have been, okay, more infrastructure, more software, more environments, more integrations, and it's an eight month, nine month, mm. 10 month thing. They're like, no, we want to go every three to four weeks and enable in new capabilities, which, by the way, is already in the core of the platform. Now let's figure out what problem we want to solve with it, right? Um, so it's an amazing, you know, they, they, they've always had work to do. Some of it's busy work and not really valuable, and it's just kind of chasing your tail. But now they're at that point where they're really solving those, those next stage of problems that often they never used to get to. I got to ask you the M&A question. You've made a few acquisitions recently, and interestingly, like, what's that discussion like? You go to the, the, the <coughs> acquisition target and say, hey, we're going to basically tear down your platform and <laughs> rebuild it in service now. Are you okay with that? I mean, take us through some of the, what's the strategy? Take us through some of the examples think, and how that went. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's got to be complementary, right? It's got to solve a real problem. And it's very difficult. You know, when you've got Fred and Pat Casey running around, 
these guys can build a lot, right? So that's a tough conversation when it happens. And you could always ask, well, why couldn't we do this on ServiceNow? Um, but you know, there's a lot of things. You buy the right people as part of, you know, you, you get the organization with the, with the technology. They built this thing already and it's successful, so you're buying the brain power in a way. And then it's a case of the better together story. How does it complement and expand what we do, right? Rather than having another silo of another product set, potentially. Um, and then, yeah, the guys, you know, they take two releases, you know, to pull it apart. Initially, it's an integration, generally, and then the next release. Um, so you'll see with IT App, right, in Istanbul, there'll be some work around it, probably, and then in the next release beyond that, Jakarta, it'll be a core in it. You know, it's, it's core. It's part of the database, the platform, and everything about it. How about the ecosystem? Um, you know, when we first saw, you know, the first, our first knowledge uh, four years ago, walked around and said, okay, this is something we're going to watch. And it's clearly expanded. You saw some acquisitions, you know, fruition, mm -hmm. cloud Sherpas. Um, summarize the strategy from the ecosystem and how it relates to your professional services strategy as well. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, the customers really like kind of going back to the core, right? Our engineers, our services people, because there really is a, you know, there's a, a feeling and a thought and evidence as well that these are the right people because they're close, right? They're, they're, they shouldn't be any, there's no one in the field better than them, right? But then you kind of get into certain situations because of geography, size, availability of resources where the partners become massively, massively important. Um, and then I think you've seen others, you know, where the likes of, you know, the big MSP and the SI customers have got three, four, five hundred certified people on service now. And, you know, they're approaching the sizes of our R&D organizations. And it's just huge, right? And because it's in the cloud, it, it changes that approach to being on site and having to code in the building. It can be done anywhere. It doesn't matter. And you only then need to go on site for those really important things and get finer detail or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, and then our partners are like, okay, the ITSM thing kind of kicks the door open. What else can we now do? You know, and you've seen us go down the HR road and the, the security road and the customer service road now. And some of the conversations are things people are building now. Um, you know, we did the hackathon in Sydney a couple of months ago, <clears throat> and the guys basically built Uber on ServiceNow, right, to see if they could get the core enabling of that technology with geo and real time and text and all that working, and they did. And it's like, okay, you know, maybe it's not as pretty as at this point, you know, based on what Fred did, maybe it will be now. Mm. Um, but it just shows all those core tenants are there and the, and the partners want to do those extra things because it's also their IP, right? And they're empowered like a customer is with this, you know, amazing platform to do things. And it's really incumbent on them to go out and solve those challenges now because the technology isn't a blocker, right? Mm -hmm. So Chris, if anyone keeps up with you on social, you are on the move <laughs> all, all the time. You are with customers all the time. You travel all around the world. I, your title should be Chief Customer Officer, so we'll, have, we'll work on uh, that. Dear Dave. Bit. <laughs> yeah, dear Dave. But I'm, I'm curious if you could share some perspective um, from the differences in the geos uh, yeah. as you travel around, kind of where are they yep. in the journey, the adoption. Obviously, there's lots of different rules. Mm -hmm. I think most of those cloud rules are, are kind of getting sorted out. But yeah. what, what do you see from kind of it's a, a really broader perspective? I think what you see in certainly in the North America region, massive focus on automation, right? The ITOM stuff, and you've been talking to Mike Nappy and guys like that. Huge, huge amount of you know, automation and that kind of acceleration of capabilities. As you start to go east, quite literally, you, know, you start hitting Europe and those areas, it becomes more process driven and kind of more focus on the business value and the outcomes of things. And then as you go even further east, you know, it, it almost becomes stronger. And you almost see that the, the budgets, in a way, are almost bigger in the Americas and they go faster for the technology. And in Europe, you tend to see them more process driven and more very systematic and methodical in their approach to implementing a process or a technology or whatever it may be. And really focus on why we're doing this, not just because we can, and it's the next widget that's on the street. Um, but then you see, you know, the where we've got the emerging markets, you know, I was just in Dubai and those kind of areas. You know, the problems they're solving are very similar, but just some of the regulations and, you know, um, even political and geo type of situations, you know, really play into it. Um, and then you get out towards the Hong Kongs and the Singapores of the world where, you know, weather is a big issue, right? Where the data centers becomes a massive problem for them. Um, and then the financial regulators as well, right? Whether you've got the SEC or the FSA in London and then out to MAS requirements in Singapore, you know, we tick all the boxes, and often you're waiting for the big bank or the big farmer to move, and everyone else is waiting for them to move. And once they move, everybody goes, right? Well. So it's, it's a really interesting kind of a phenomenon. And, and you know, as a presenter and a speaker and those kind of things, 
you have to twist and turn your messaging, kind of on the fly and do a bit of a dance every now and again, as ugly as that image might look, right? You gotta do the dance and really focus on how they wanna solve the problem. It's the same problem, there are no new problems, but the way you approach it and talk to it is different based on absolutely the audience you're talking to. And Japan is an interesting nut to crack. It's gonna take a while. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had some experience and it just takes a long time. What are you yeah. seeing in that part of the world? Yeah, this, again, the sales cycles tend to be a little bit longer and it's more relationship driven mm -hmm. and very process and methodical and making sure all the boxes are ticked. You know, the regulatory wise, it's, it's, a, you know, it's huge. But like you say, once you crack it, be ready because yeah, it's yeah. going to come, right? And it's the snowball effect, right? And it just becomes this massive thing that starts rolling. So, you know, we're making good progress in those areas and making the appropriate investments where we need to without going all in and, you know, having a massive crash as a result of, you know, oh, well, we thought that would work and it didn't. It's a very methodical target approach. And that's where the partner network becomes crucial. You know, the, a lot of the service providers and SIs have huge presence in that area of the world. So that's where we also leverage those guys as mm -hmm. best we can and almost let them lead the charge a little bit and then come in behind them and support them as a result. Do you bake the cakes? Well, <laughs> well clearly I may eat them. I don't know. Well, it's, just, it's, you know, it's such an integral part of this culture and, yep. and there is no place where more cakes and happy customers are published than on your social stream. I mean, you, know, you are there with them. <clears throat> it's a phenomenon, it really is, and it started by them. This is what's amazing, right? And it's just something different. And now we're seeing some of the others trying to catch up and we've seen some competitors try to copy us, but they're just not going to have the volume, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, and I think, you know, we sat here a year ago and I threw the challenge down and we just had another conversation about it. So I felt, you know, and we talked about this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, is, uh, you know, how this event for you guys is run and how we, you know, we, we schedule these interviews and things. So there's a little bit of an incentive, a little bit of pre-work here. <laughs> so I've got you pre-Go Live Cakes. Okay. And the challenge is thrown down. This time next year at Knowledge, we'll have your cake and you'll be live on ServiceNow. How's that sound? You're uh, on. I, I, is, you're on. Can we accelerate that time frame? Uh, whatever that, you want to do. Is that possible? I, mean, I, we do. I don't know how complicated all, right. all this stuff is, but you tell me. You tell us the problem, we do the technology. I look forward to a uh, cube cake coming soon. There you go, fantastic. All right, Chris. Uh, all right we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bake that cake. <laughs> we're going to put that cake in the oven with, with you, so now we'll take on that challenge. Chris Pope, thanks very much for Absolute coming to the pleasure. cube. It was great to see you. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. All thanks, right, Chris. keep right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this word.